All right, well, thank you for having me here, and um, we'll just get started. So uh, as uh, Joni said, I'm a urologist, so I specialize in um, men's reproductive uh, health. All right, so tonight we'll talk about sort of an overview of erectile dysfunction. We'll discuss some of the health problems that put men at risk for erectile dysfunction, and then we'll review sort of current treatment options, especially as they relate to cancer. So what is erectile dysfunction? Can everybody hear me? So what is erectile dysfunction? So it's the consistent or recurrent inability of a man to attain or maintain a penile erection sufficient for sexual activity. And certainly erectile dysfunction can impact one's total health and quality of life. So how common is it? So studies estimate probably about 50% of men aged 40 to 70 are afflicted by erectile dysfunction in this country. It's about 30 million men in the US. It certainly increases with aging. And when we look at etiology, probably about 90% is organic, about 10% is uh, psychological. So there are many uh, organic or physical causes that you know, we can identify. So this is um, the data of the prevalence of erectile dysfunction in this country. So this is from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study. So a large cross-sectional study of men in Massachusetts, age 40 to 70, and what you can see is 52% of men have erectile dysfunction of some form. So you, know, you can certainly stratify by severity into complete, moderate, and minimal. But still, more than half of all men in this age group have some form of erectile dysfunction. So very, very common. And so why should we be concerned about it? Well, certainly it affects quality of life. It can influence general health perceptions for men. It's certainly an unmet medical need, and it may be the first sign of other um, important health, health problems. So some shared risk factors, the erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. So hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, depression, smoking, obesity, and sedentary lifestyle. So when we think about erectile dysfunction, you know, one of the problems <clears throat> you can imagine, you know, the way that erections work, blood goes into the penis and gets trapped there. And so if blood doesn't get in as efficiently, you'll have erectile dysfunction. So really, on sort of a fundamental level, erectile dysfunction is a vascular problem. It's a blood vessel problem. <clears throat> and sort of the reason that it kind of shares a lot of risk factors with cardiovascular disease or cerebrovascular disease is sort of because of that, because of that common etiology of the blood vessel. So we look at health problems, either hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, tobacco, they all lead to these increased oxidants which can then injure endothelial cells. And these are the cells that line the inside of our blood vessels. And when these are injured, the blood vessels can develop atherosclerosis or scarring. They can constrict and get narrow. They can even form clots. And all that can lead to problems like, such as erectile dysfunction, heart attack, strokes, all that sort of, sort of thing. <clears throat> and it actually turns out that erectile dysfunction may be one of the earliest manifestations of this. So I think this. Um, this picture sort of represents it nicely, why erectile dysfunction may occur before some of these other problems. So if we compare the size of blood vessels in different organs, so on the left, we have a penile blood vessel. Right next to it here is a, a coronary blood vessel or one of the blood vessels in the heart. A penile blood vessel is probably about one millimeter. Coronary blood vessels or heart blood vessels are probably about three to four millimeters. So it's much easier to block a penile blood vessel because it's so, so much smaller. And so sometimes, and often erectile dysfunction actually manifests before you know, heart disease or cerebrovascular disease. So it sometimes can be a real warning sign. So again, the physical causes of erectile dysfunction, diabetes, heart disease, <clears throat> pelvic surgery, radiation, or cancer treatments, certain medications, spinal injury, and then hormone imbalances such as low testosterone. There's also some major lifestyle factors that can predisposed to erectile dysfunction, such as depression, obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, <clears throat> heavy alcohol use, drug use, and certainly tobacco use. Again, we, I talked about before, probably 90% of the causes of erectile dysfunction are organic. So there's physical causes. And you can see, <clears throat> when we look at them, vascular is a large majority, 40%, diabetes, 30%, medications, especially antihypertensive, so blood pressure medications can cause this a lot. You see surgery here. This is mostly surgery that would be for cancer. And then there's a smattering of other causes as well. So let's focus on cancer here. And we'll focus on pelvic surgery, and this would be for bladder, prostate, colon, rectal cancer. So first, this is sort of an overview of the anatomy. <clears throat> 
And for those of you that did not do urologic training, I'll kind of go over this. So here, this represents the bladder. Right next to it is the prostate. The rectum is behind it here. So we're kind of looking at a man sideways. And the urethra and the penis. And so the flow of urine would be from the bladder, through the prostate, through the urethra, and then out the tip of the penis. And what's important here is just behind, sort of in between the prostate bladder and the rectum, is what's called the neurovascular bundle. And this is the blood vessels and the nerves that really control erections and allow erections. And so any kind of surgery or radiation treatment that involves this area really puts this area at risk, potentially. And so when we look at it in another way, this is sort of another view where we have the same view that we saw before, but now we're going to look at cross-section of these two areas. So this is the prostate here. <clears throat> and we'll focus here. So the prostate, we're looking at crossways. And the neurovascular bundle is going to be on kind of the side, the corners here, where the rectum is below, prostate is above. So these are the, the nerves and the arteries that really are very important for erections. And so when you remove the prostate, you know, you want to separate the nerves and the arteries kind of off this area. And if it was sort of situated like this, it would be pretty straightforward, but unfortunately the nerves and the arteries are really kind of smattered all throughout here. And so inevitably as during this dissection, um, these nerves, these arteries get injured. And oftentimes they recover, but not always. Um, but this is one of the, the reasons that pelvic surgery or radiation to this area as well, it's difficult to precisely target the prostate or the rectum. Some of these other areas do get some collateral damage and that's, and that's why they're at risk. And so how do we, what do we do about erectile dysfunction? Well, you know, obviously magic is not the answer, but we do have lots of treatments. So you don't have to live with erectile dysfunction and actually nearly every man can be successfully treated. So when I see men, I'm universally optimistic because it's very, very rare that we cannot get them back erections. If you, we can be as aggressive as you want to be and if you want to take it all the way, probably 90, more than 99% of men, we can get erections. So what are the different treatment options? And we'll kind of give an overview here and then we'll go through them step by step. So there's medical treatment through hormones. This would mostly be testosterone, if that's needed. There's oral medications that we're certainly all familiar with, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. Something called vacuum erection devices. Injection therapy into the penis. There's urethral suppositories and penile implants. We'll start with testosterone supplementation. So as, as we age, our testosterone levels go down, and testosterone is very important for normal sexual function in men. And, there's, and if it's low and we replace it, we can actually improve both the sexual function and sexual desire. And there are several ways that we give testosterone back if it's necessary. So there's injections, there's transdermal, either gels or patches, and there's even testosterone pellets, which we can, in a little office procedure, implant them under the skin, and they'll slowly dissolve over time. So again, testosterone is very important for normal sexual function. It's very important for normal erections. And men with low testosterone have diminished response by themselves and to a lot of these medications. And if we improve the testosterone level, we can actually improve response to all these therapies that we're going to talk about. So some of the medical therapies. So Viagra <clears throat> came about in 98. Five years later, we had Levitra, Vardenafil, and then Cialis. And these have been well studied, well more than 100 trials, well more than tens of thousands of men now. Over 20 million men have taken this, and now it's safe, safety of these medications has been well established since their inception in 98, so over about 14 years of, of data on these, and it's a very safe, effective medication. And how does it work? So, Side by side here, we have a flaccid penis and an erect penis, and what you can see during a normal response is that basically there's a, a large influx, again, of blood, and everything kind of dilates. So these are the erectile bodies are up here, the urethra is down here, and some of the nerves and arteries are up top. And during a normal erection, basically what you get is the erectile body sort of engorge, and they're kind of this spongy tissue that helps trap this tissue in. Everything kind of gets larger. So these blood vessels sort of relax and dilate and open up and let blood flow in. 
And so this is sort of a complicated and a busy slide, but I just want to briefly kind of go over how these medications work. So normally what happens is our blood vessels, again, endothelial, sorry, blood vessel cells, our endothelial cells produce nitric oxide. And basically that leads to this little signal called CGMP, which leads to relaxation of our blood vessels, which lets in blood. Unfortunately, what happens is that some of this signal is broken down, digested by this enzyme, phosphodiesterase. And so what these medications do, Viagra or Levitra Cialis, is they block this. So more of this signal leads to more smooth muscle relaxation and allows these blood vessels to open up and stay open for longer. Now, all these medications work through that same pathway, but they are a little bit different, mostly in their pharmacokinetics. <clears throat> and specifically, how long they last in our body and how quickly they reach peak concentration. So that's the main difference between them. So sildenafil is Viagra, Vardenafil is Levitra, and Tadalafil is Cialis. And so we're going to look at Tmax, and that's how long it takes for these medications to reach a peak in our bloodstream. And then T half is how long, basically, it stays in our body. And so what you can appreciate here is that one of the main differences, looking at the T half here, is that Cialis lasts about 18 hours, or the half-life is about 18 hours. So it really it's marketed as sort of a weekend pill. And there's some reason for that, because one pill really will stay in your system for, se for several days. Whereas the other medications, Viagra and Levitra, they stay in our system for probably about eight hours or so. Onset of action, maybe it takes a little longer for Cialis, but in general, these are all working about one to two hours for most men. And do they work? Well, they do. So this is Viagra here is the first little set of bars. Levitra is the second pair. And then Cialis is the third pair here. And we have placebo, so a sugar pill versus the active agent. And you can see this dramatic improvement versus sugar pill versus all these medications. So they all will lead to dramatic improvement in erections lasting long enough for sexual intercourse. And this is from an early study on Viagra where they asked the partners, do you want your partner to continue to use this medication? And you can see 5% of the women said they don't want it, but 95% said they were very happy and wanted their partner to continue to use it. So it does work well, and partners are very satisfied. Another option is intracavernosal injection. So it's an injection of an agent directly into the penis. And the agents that we use are actually very similar mechanistically, you can think, to Viagra in that class. Basically, they allow dilation of these blood vessels at a very local level. So again, if we kind of come back to the cross-section of the penis in these erectile bodies here, we inject the agent. And that's how it'll act. Now, obviously, no one likes the idea of putting a needle in their penis. <laughs> Certainly a psychological barrier to that. <clears throat> but men do well. And it's a very small needle. So it's a 29 gauge needle, if anybody has familiarity with the size of a needle, but that's about one one hundredth of an inch, a third of a millimeter, or it's about a thick, thickness of three pieces of human hair. So it's very small, and usually when men do it, you know, obviously you build it up in your mind appropriately, but it's not that bad, is what I would say 90% of men say. So men do well with this, and it does work very well. There are several different formulations that we use. Um, we can actually get it compounded to really bring the cost down. So I don't know if anybody has any experience with Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. Those tend to be pretty expensive medications. So insurance sometimes pays for some, but if you're going to buy them by yourself, it would be $15 to $25 each. These injections can probably be about 2 to $4 per injection. So for cost-effective reasons, it's, it's hard to beat these injections. Now another option is a urethral suppository. And basically what you do is you're delivering a little, little agent directly into the urethra. And sort of a, how this works is basically you put it in, you squeeze it uh, into the urethra, and then you kind of massage it in. And the idea is very similar to the injections, slowly absorbed into the penis. And it'll give you an erection in probably about 10 or 15 minutes that'll last about 20 to 30 minutes. There's also something called a vacuum erection device. And there's and there's several iterations of this, but essentially there's a cylinder which you put over your penis, and then there's a pump, either a manual pump or there's now battery-operated ones that create a vacuum in this chamber. 
then pull blood into the penis, and then you can put a constrictive band at the base to capture the blood in the penis, and then you can use that for intercourse. So that also works well. We sometimes use this in a rehabilitative setting, which we'll go into a little bit later. But basically, <clears throat> you know, afterwards, we do want to continue to have our penis get these normal erections or get erections. And so it's thought that using this on a regular basis can help um, with stretching and length maintenance afterwards. We'll kind of go back to this a little later. And then the final option is the inflatable penile prosthesis. So this is a surgery we do to put this inflatable device in the penis. So there's the cylinders here that go inside the penis. There's a reservoir that houses the extra fluid that goes just behind the pubic bone. And then there's a pump that goes in your scrotum. And essentially, whenever you want to have sex, you, you can feel the pump in the scrotum, pump it up, and it'll fill up these cylinders in the penis, which will give you a rigid erection. So we you know, offer it to all men, essentially. But men that choose it tend to have tried other treatments that don't work or they're not happy with them. We have a lot of experience first developed in the 70s, so now it's on you know, the umpteenth iteration. About 25,000 are done every year. And they're very high patient and partner satisfaction. So again, you know, I always want to qualify this. This is a very self-selected population, so you know, we don't tie men down and force them to do this. They decide they want one of these surgeries. So, but in general, once they get it, they're very happy. So you can see 90% satisfaction rate. So 96% say they do the procedure again. 92% would recommend it to other people. And similar for partners, 96% satisfaction, 90% say they'd recommend it to other couples. So it is a long-term solution. You know, it gives some freedom in terms of, you know, return of spontaneity. So you can, anytime you want to have sex, you can basically activate the device. And there's sort of three main flavors. I talked a little about the inflatable, the three-piece inflatable. We'll kind of go over all of them. So the first is it's called a one-piece or a malleable. And essentially, this is sort of a, a piece of plastic that goes in the penis that's malleable. So when you're not using it, you push it down. And when you are using it, you kind of bend it up. It's a good option for men that don't have, sort of have limited dexterity. It's a less risky operation. There's only one piece, so the risk of infection is a little bit low. But you know, in the flaccid state, it doesn't get fully flaccid, um, so that's, that's a disadvantage. The two-piece <clears throat> has an inflatable device in the, in the shaft of the penis and then a pump again. Um, the disadvantage is probably that it doesn't get as flaccid as the three-piece, which we, we talked about earlier. So because there's only two pieces and not the reservoir that houses the extra fluid, it doesn't get all the way flaccid, but it also works very well um, and probably a little lower risk of infection just because it's a smaller, there's less hardware. And the results works well. And certainly there's moving parts in these, so they're not designed to last forever, but you know, again, this is, they're on the umpteenth generation now since the 70s, so they're, in general they're supposed to last about 10 to 15 years with normal use. And so here at three years, about 90% of patients are very happy with their device. So, in summary, erectile dysfunction is a common problem. Nearly every man can be successfully treated. And some treatments are more effective than others depending on the individual patient. And so patients should certainly discuss treatment with their physicians and their partners and decide what's best for them. And now with some remaining time, I want to talk about new strategies for erectile dysfunction after cancer therapy in sort of a rehabilitation setting. <clears throat> So daily erections are natural and necessary, and without erections, atrophy and scarring can develop. So you can imagine if I break my arm and put it in a cast for two months, when I take it off, it's gonna, the arm's gonna be a little smaller, the, the muscle will have atrophied. And that same process can happen in the penis too, but in addition to atrophy of the muscle, there are actually some scarring develops, and that can lead to some functional consequences and also some length loss. So as much as possible, we wanna avoid this, obviously, and so interventions aimed at kind of maintaining and restoring function really allow for irregular erections. And so there's some animal data supporting this. Um, a lot of these studies look at prostate cancer and prostate surgery. And so what we know from animal data is when we give Viagra a little bit before surgery and maintain it afterwards, there's much improvement in nerve regrowth after surgery. It prevents some of this scarring that I talked about in the penis and can help 
maintain the health of the penile arteries. But it's also thought to be very time dependent. So it is something that you want to you wanna start early. And when we talk about penile rehabilitation, again, we want to be aggressive. We want to do it early because, you know, the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we want to maintain it. And there's some data to support that. <clears throat> so this is a study. And the red here, we have men that did not undergo any sort of rehabilitation program. And this is after radical prostatectomy. And the blue is men that did undergo rehabilitation program. And what we can see when we look at all these different measures, functional erections. So this is 18 months afterwards, how many men got unassisted erections? 52% of men in a rehabilitation program versus just 19% that didn't do anything. Response to Viagra, 64% of men that did engage in a rehabilitation program versus only 24% without. And then response to this, uh, the injection therapy, 95% of men that went through a rehabilitation program versus about three quarters who didn't. So some pretty significant differences. So what are the different things that we use in this rehabilitation program? Well, one is you know, these phosphodiesterase inhibitors, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. And so this was a study where a month after surgery, they gave men nightly, nightly Viagra, either 50 milligram or 100 milligram dose. And then they followed them for about a year and wanted to see a re return of spontaneous function. And we can see with placebo, again, sugar pill, only about 4% of men regained function, whereas when Viagra was introduced, about 30% of men regained function. And really, that's the only intervention. So it just makes some sense, again, from animal data supporting to kind of maintain penile health, penile blood flow, we can help preserve function. And this is true, actually, for all these interventions that I talked about. So for intercavernosal injection, this is one of the first places that this idea of rehabilitation came about. The study done on 30 men after prostate surgery. 15 men used this injections, 15 did not. And at three months after, 53% of men were getting spontaneous erections that had used the regular uh, injection therapy versus just 20% of men that did not. For the <clears throat> intraurethral medicine, in 91 men, 56 were using the medications, 45% did not use the medications, and at six months, 38% getting spontaneous erections versus 11% who didn't do anything. So you can see these are, you know, comparing one study to the other is always a little difficult, but what we can see internally, these pretty big differences. And the vacuum erection device, I talked about this a little bit earlier. So the way that it works, it sort of treats your penis as a vein. So the blood that it's pulling in is not oxygenated. So some of these other benefits that I talk about are not necessarily gonna occur, but one thing it does do is definitely engorges the penis and stretches the penis out, which is very important for length maintenance. So that's what this study looked at, length maintenance after prostate removal. So 39 men, and these men were counseled to use a vacuum erection device about five or 10 minutes a day, once or twice a day, five to seven days a week. And so they wanted to see who actually did that. So about 36% of men did it about 50% of the time. About Three men use it less than 25% of the time, and they basically just looked at length maintenance, so they measured penises. <clears throat> and what we can see is that the men that use this, the vacuum erection device on a pretty regular basis, only one man had greater than a centimeter length loss. However, men that didn't really use it, two of the three men, again, small numbers, but still pretty interesting, had a greater than one centimeter length loss. So it kind of makes sense if you stretch your penis out regularly as all the nerves are regenerating after surgery, hopefully we can maintain length. So at Stanford, we do prescribe to this. We have a pretty aggressive penile preservation protocol. You know, a lot of this, again, I see a lot of patients after prostate cancer surgery, prostate cancer radiation, but this can be tailored to really any, any cancer, and I think the same principles apply. But basically, you put them on early, either Cialis or Viagra. We check check hormone levels and replace that if it's indicated. We start vacuum erection devices, again, the oral pills if needed, and then if that's not working, we take the next step. We move up to injections. We move up to the urethral suppositories. All that to restore these normal erections in an early period, and hopefully spontaneous erections will, will be restored. So again, early treatment's important, and early treatment is effective. And with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to Dr. Milheiser. All right. Hi, everyone. So we heard a great talk on male sexual health. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about female sexuality following a cancer diagnosis. When we talk about female sexual function after cancer, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about comes from the data on breast cancer and gynecologic cancer patients. However, it can be applied to all different kinds of cancers because essentially women experience the same thing when they undergo treatment for many different kinds of cancers, whether it be radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, and we'll talk about that. We have to sit down. Whoop. Thank you. <laughs> so if you look at cancer and female sexuality, um, I thought this was an interesting statistic from the American Cancer Society from this year. And basically, in 2012, around 800,000 new cases of cancer will be diagnosed. This is in men and women. If you look at the five-year survival rate in the 1970s, it was about 49%. And if you look at the five-year survival rate for all cancers diagnosed between 2001 and 2007, it's 67%. So a lot of what I do in my practice here at Stanford is really focus on survivorship. What is survivorship? It's the time someone's diagnosed with cancer and everything that happens after that. So we see that people are living longer with cancer, which is great, and a lot of that has to do with the treatments available and earlier diagnosis, there's a sort of a, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword in that, yes, there's great treatment now, but the treatment that we have for women for a lot of these different cancers can wreak havoc on our body for the rest of our lives. So we'll get into a little bit about that and what it means and what we do about it. Oh, I'm so sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. So 50% of women with breast or gynecologic cancer also colorectal cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, this really does apply across the board, will experience long-term sexual dysfunction following their treatment. Now compare that to um, men. So men oftentimes following their treatment, they'll have about 90 to 100% of men and women will have in the first year following their diagnosis sexual dysfunction. However, for most of those cancers, oftentimes their symptoms will resolve over time. For women, especially the breast and gynecologic cancer patients, they will continue to have lifelong sexual dysfunction, about 50%. The two most common problems that we see are loss of desire for sex, or low libido, and then the vaginal dryness and pain. Those are probably the two most common complaints I hear from people who have been diagnosed with cancer. Now, it's not just the women who experience these problems, it's also their partners as well. So if you look at the data, again, so about 84% of partners of women with a reproductive cancer type, meaning a gynecologic cancer type, versus 76% 70, of partners of women with a non-reproductive cancer type, those people, the partners of the women, will report an impact on their sexual relationship. So when we talk to the woman, we're not just talking to her alone, we're talking to her and, and her partner if she has one. 59% of the female partners and 79% of the male partners reported lack of or decreased frequency of sex and intimacy. And why does this happen? It happens because of treatment. It happens because there's, you know, there's fatigue, there's exhaustion, there's emotional exhaustion that goes along with being a caretaker of someone who's dealing with cancer. Viewing the person with cancer as a patient rather than a sexual partner. I hear this a lot. So I actually have had women who don't have cancer who come in to see me and say, I have low interest in sex, I just, I'm having problems having orgasms, I just don't have arousal, and the reason is is because I don't look at my partner the same way since he was diagnosed or she was diagnosed with cancer. I look at them more as, a, as like a child, almost like I'm their caretaker now. That does evolve over time. It requires counseling in many cases, but it's really important to look not just at the woman, but also at the partner if they have one, and that's what we do. It's a big part of what we do. So what are the treatments with the greatest influence on sexual function? Chemotherapy is probably the biggest. Surgery, radiation therapy, and then hormonal manipulation. Hormonal manipulation usually has to do with women, for example, who have been diagnosed with a estrogen, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer who are then put on tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor following their diagnosis and acute treatment. So when we talk about chemotherapy, one of the biggest things we see in premenopausal women is that they end up going into what's called premature ovarian failure, which otherwise means uh, early menopause. It's one of the most significant factors affecting sexuality. And why is that? When a woman goes through menopause, her testosterone and her estrogen both nosedive. Estrogen and testosterone are the two hormones that are essential for healthy sexual function in women. 
So premenopausal women who have undergone uh, premature ovarian failure, failure most commonly will experience what's called dyspareunia, which is pain with painful intercourse or painful attempted intercourse. And that's due to vaginal dryness and thinning of the vaginal lining. Again, all due to this lack of estrogen and testosterone. Other side effects that can affect sexuality, hair loss or alopecia. So that's one of the most distressing side effects for women. Many women, obviously, it impacts their, their body image. So one of the things that we always counsel oncologists, um, especially our residents when they're working in the oncology department at VIRGYN, is not just to talk about losing hair on your head, because whenever we think of cancer patients who have undergone chemotherapy, we think of hair loss on the head. Hair is lost all over the body. So we have to teach our patients and also to teach our, our residents um, to talk about the fact that pubic hair will be lost. There are women who will say, when I lost my hair, I just didn't feel sexual anymore because I felt like a child. I didn't have pubic hair, and children don't have pubic hair, and children don't have sex. So there's a lot of, the, we have to think about the psychological impact as well. Fatigue is a big one. If someone's tired, it, this doesn't matter if you have cancer, or if you're working too hard, or if you have kids, fatigue leads to loss of sexual interest. Weight changes, weight going up or down. Of course, the nausea or the nerve uh, dysfunction that people can experience, so nerve pain that people can experience. Um, and then infertility. This is another big one. Oftentimes, people, women aren't told, you know, if you go through premature ovarian failure, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to have children in the future. Your fertility and your cycles don't always come back. So that in itself can have a very negative uh, impact on a woman, what we call sexual self schema, or the way they look at themselves sexually. Um, this is also a very big challenge for the single cancer survivor. So, for example, those women who are in their 20s and 30s who are single when they're diagnosed with cancer, they've now gone through chemotherapy um, and have gone through premature ovarian cancer uh, failure. The big problem for them is how do I talk to a prospective partner about the fact that I can't have children? How do I tell somebody that I'm 25 years old and I'm essentially a menopausal woman at this point? So this is a really difficult challenge for women who are young and single at the time that they're diagnosed. <clears throat> surgery, you know, there's various surgeries that can impact sexual function, whether it be body image related to mastectomy, or for example, in this case, radical hysterectomy that we do with either uh, uterine cancer or cervical cancer. This in itself can cause shortening of the vagina and disruption of vascular nerve supplies, which can then lead to difficulties with sexual arousal, orgasmic response, and oftentimes pain because the vagina has become shortened. What about radiation therapy? Well, radiation therapy is often used to treat breast cancer and pelvic cancer, such as uterine, cervix, and rectal, rectal uh, and anal cancers. Um, radiation therapy is destructive in that it kills both cancer cells, which is the goal, but it also kills healthy cells as well, and that's what leads to the side effects. What are these side effects? Well, for many women, it's fatigue, range of motion difficulty. So for women who are getting um, radiation for their breast cancer, they can also often have shoulder immobility as a result. Skin changes, so sort of redness and tenderness to the skin. Loss of hair in the area, which can be, again, problematic for people undergoing pelvic um, radiation therapy. Vaginal stenosis. This is probably the one that I see most common in the colorectal and anal cancers, as well as the pelvic cancers. So vaginal stenosis is when the vaginal lining literally sticks together because of scarring. And so a woman's vagina is usually about that long. It's usually about 10 to 11 centimeters. It's very common for a woman to come back after pelvic radiation therapy and her vagina is half that size. And that's because of the inflammation that occurs in those cells and it causes them to scar together. So it's called vaginal stenosis, and again, due to scarring from the radiation therapy, which can lead to, again, dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse. It can also, um, if you're having abdominal radiation therapy, can also affect the ovaries and also lead to infertility as well. So what about these hormonal manipulator, manipulators that we were talking about? Well, this is a big one. Has anybody ever heard of an aromatase inhibitor? So aromatase inhibitors, women who get put on them are women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer that's estrogen receptor positive. This is <clears throat> sort of taking the place for tamoxifen in postmenopausal women. The problem with an aromatase inhibitor is the goal is to suppress your natural estrogen levels to undetectable. So a woman who's postmenopausal already has very low 
estrogen levels. You're now putting her on this medication. So anything she may have left is now taken away from her. So this can cause severe vaginal symptoms. So what women experience is what's called atrophic vaginitis. They uh, experience frequent urinary tract infections, vaginal dryness, vaginal burning, decreased lubrication during sexual arousal, and pain with vaginal penetration. They can also experience menopausal symptoms. So let's say they went through menopause 10 years prior. These symptoms can come back, hot flushes, night sweats, insomnia, and irritability, uh, low libido, and joint pain. So one of the biggest complaints women have is joint pain. So they, that's oftentimes one of the reasons that they go off this medication prematurely. What about tamoxifen? Tamoxifen, again, is another one of these uh, medications we give to women. So this is what they're given for five years, sometimes longer, following their acute treatment with radiation and chemotherapy. So women on tamoxifen can experience a, a watery vaginal discharge, fatigue, leg cramps is a big problem, vaginal dryness. If so some women don't experience the vaginal uh, moisture, they get the vaginal dryness and painful intercourse. Um, and then a little bit more rarely, they get cataracts and headache. The decreased libido, this is sort of up for debate right now. There's a lot of data coming out that tamoxifen probably in itself does not cause low libido. It's probably as a result of these other symptoms like fatigue and uh, vaginal dryness and pain. Men can also take tamoxifen if they've had breast cancer and it's, if, and it's an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And uh, they get symptoms such as headache, nausea, skin rash, impotence, decreased sexual interest. So risk-reducing bilateral subping ovarectomy, what does that mean? It means prophylactically taking out somebody's ovaries. So this is something we do for women who have been diagnosed with a BRCA gene, which is the gene that leads to ovarian cancer and breast cancer. And it's usually done on premenopausal women. We recommend doing it usually in their 30s after they've completed um, childbearing. When we remove somebody's ovaries, we're removing again their primary source of estrogen and testosterone. Estrogen and testosterone are very important for sexual health and general um, overall health. So testosterone is responsible for bone mass, muscle mass, overall mood, and sexual drive. When we take out somebody's ovaries, again, we are putting them into early premature menopause, so we get those hot flashes and night sweats. And then we've got the decline in sexual functioning, which we talked about. Um, one of the most important things we can do for women before they undergo this type of surgery is to actually explain to them what's going to happen because one of the most common things I hear is no one ever talked to me about what my symptoms were going to be like, the fact that I wasn't going to have a libido, the fact that you know I was going to have such profound vaginal dryness. And in many of these cases, we can't put women back on estrogen and testosterone. So one of the most important things we can do is actually prepare them for what these side effects can be. Medications that are associated with sexual dysfunction in uh, cancer survivors, anxiety medications, very common for women to be placed on uh, antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications. Anything that alters the central nervous system is going to affect your libido. So anti-anxiety, pain medications, neuromodulators, which we frequently put people on for these neuropathies that uh, you get with chemotherapy. Anti-nausea, antidepressant, and sleeping aids, all of these in, in themselves can cause low libido, and usually it's through uh, the fact that it's affecting the central nervous system. What about people who've undergone bone marrow transplant? Well, this is just a study that was done and published about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and what they found is that people who um, had leukemia who underwent bone marrow transplant did experience decreased sexual interest and activity, decreased pleasure from sexual activity, decreased ability to have sex and infertility, and these symptoms were greater in men than women. So now that we've talked about sort of what the problems are, how do we treat them? What do we do about them? Well, the good news is that we do have medications to treat these problems. The bad news is, is that the FDA is not so great about approving these medications for use in sexual dysfunction. So just out of curiosity, how many medications do you guys think there are for the treatment of sexual dysfunction in women? Somebody yell out a number. Okay. Um, how many do you think there are for men? <laughs> sure does feel that way sometimes. Um, there is one medication that is, sex that is approved by the FDA for the treatment of sexual dysfunction in women, and it's not going to knock anybody's socks off. It's Premarin Vaginal Cream, which has been around for years. And it was recently, well, recently in the last five years, approved 
for the treatment of vaginal dryness. So it's not like it's anything new. The FDA has now uh, blocked three medications that have been brought up for the treatment of sexual dysfunction. I've been involved with all three of these medications. They should have been approved, but they weren't. We've got a couple more coming down the pipeline, so hopefully those will. But for now, everything we use is off-label, meaning it hasn't been FDA approved for treatment in women. However, we've got enough safety and efficacy data to show that it is safe and it is uh, effective. So when we're addressing sexual dysfunction, we're dealing with pharmacotherapy, which are just your medications that you get from the pharmacy. Nutraceuticals, anybody know what that is? Nutraceutical is when an herbal therapy is used for treatment of some kind of disease state. Certain devices, vaginal moisturizers, vaginal lubricants, and counseling. Counseling is a huge part for both a woman and her partner. It's especially important, we found, if there was any sexual dysfunction before the, relation, before the cancer diagnosis, if there was any relationship dysfunction before the diagnosis, it's gonna get worse following a cancer diagnosis. I think we all like to, in a sense, romanticize that couples, you know, they, we come closer together and it's, you know, it's great. It's in a sense good for the relationship. And the reality is that's not the case. The reality is these things will typically get worse. So what do we do about vaginal dryness and painful intercourse? Well, the two most common treatments are vaginal estrogen and vaginal moisturizers. There are many women with reproductive cancers and breast cancer who cannot use vaginal estrogen, and we're going to talk about who can and who can't. So vaginal estrogen, the breast cancer survivor. With the increasing use of aerobitase inhibitors, which we talked about, which lowers your estrogen levels to non-detectable, ideally. It doesn't really make sense to put a woman on vaginal estrogen. Now, vaginal estrogen is the most effective treatment for vaginal dryness and pain during intercourse, which is what aromatase inhibitors cause, severe vaginal dryness. However, if the whole point is putting somebody on this medication to suppress their levels to non-detectable, I'm sort of going against that by putting you on vaginal estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is minimally absorbed. However, it will slightly increase your circulating estrogen levels. Having said that, there are cases where vaginal estrogen goes in the vagina. Sometimes we will use a small amount of cream on the outside at the opening of the vagina that's almost hardly absorbed. Small amount will be. But sometimes if we've tried every single thing possible for quality of life, we will give uh, these aromatase in, uh, inhibitor users a little bit of vaginal estrogen. But generally, it is considered contraindicated in the aromatase inhibitor user. For people who are on tamoxifen or people who have a breast cancer that has its hormone receptor negative, we will put them on a little bit of vaginal estrogen therapy. When people call me and say, I have people from the community call me and ask me, is it okay if I put my patient on vaginal estrogen? She has a history of breast cancer. She's on tamoxifen. The answer is maybe. And the reason I say maybe is because that's something that each physician should talk. I always talk to my um, oncologist. So if a patient come to me and say, I want, to be on I want to be on estrogen, I call the oncologist and I say, listen, here's the data, here's what we know. And the fact is, vaginal estrogen has never been shown to cause breast cancer, but it's never not been shown to cause breast cancer. However, anecdotally, if you measure a woman's serum estrogen levels while she's on tamoxifen, and then you check them three months later, Oftentimes, you will not see an appreciable increase in their serum estrogen levels. So we feel that it is probably safe. However, you want to use there are certain formulations you want to use and certain ones that you don't. So you want to contact the oncologist, agree on a plan. Check, I always check serum estrogen levels at baseline before they start using it and every three months for the first year. And you want to use the lowest dose options, which are a vaginal tablet like a Vagifem or a vaginal ring, or, which is called E-string. I personally feel that the most effective one out of the two is the Vagifem, and that's pretty much all I use with my patients. Vagifem is also um, extremely low dose. The ring is just a ring about this size. It goes in the vagina for three months and sits there. It does not need to be removed during intercourse, but I feel if a patient is very sexually active, it's better that you go with the tablet instead. The vaginal tablet is just a 10 microgram tablet. It's placed twice a week, and studies have shown significant improvement in the vaginal dryness symptoms. 
What about those women who have been on aromatase inhibitors for a long time or have been postmenopausal for a long time, having severe vaginal dryness, pain during intercourse, and they come in, and remember we talked about the vagina being 10 centimeters? Vag being postmenopausal, whether you have cancer or not, will shrink the vagina. If you don't, I think uh, Dr. Eisenberg said it before, if you don't use it, you lose it, okay? That's the truth. So if you don't have sex often and you're not on any vaginal estrogen and you're postmenopausal, naturally the vagina is gonna shrink. It's gonna become less, so it's gonna become more narrow and it's gonna become shorter. So oftentimes we have women use vaginal dilators. These are vaginal dilators over here. And those are you know, obviously all different sizes. We have women start with the smallest one they can tolerate. They wear it five days a week, meaning they lay down, put it in the vagina for just about half an hour and just let it sit there. So it acts to stretch the vagina. Ideally, it works best when also using vaginal estrogen, but for women who can't use vaginal estrogen, we have them use a non-hormonal vaginal moisturizer. Non-hormonal moisturizers are non-prescription, basically act to replenish water to the vagina. They last longer than just a lubricant, which is what you would use during sex. Um, and it's used, like I said, for dryness. One of the most commonly used is Replens. Has anybody heard of Replens before? Replens is extremely effective, but you have to use it three days a week, and you have to use it for at least two months to notice an improvement. So a lot of people will come to me and say, I used it for a week, I hated the discharge, and I stopped. It does cause a watery, clumpy vaginal discharge. Um, we tell people to wear a panty liner. And oftentimes they'll come back after two months and say, you know what, I really do notice a difference. And this is probably the best, the non-hormonal vaginal moisturizers, and I've listed some other ones down here. The reason I mentioned Replens is because it has a lot of data behind it. But there's also these that I've listed below. I think the Me Again is actually a paraben-free vaginal moisturizer. I know a lot of people are really into having paraben-free items. Paraben-free items probably don't work at quite as well, but the, jur the verdict, or the jury, I should say, is still out on what impact parabens actually have. So for now, you know, I do recommend the Replens and all the ones that I've me mentioned here. They used to have one called KY Liquid Beads, but that's actually been discontinued. That was also a very good one as well. Lubricants. So lubricants are what we use actually during sex. So this is for moisture during sex. There are three types. There's water-based, silicone-based, and oils. The water-based lubricants are the ones that most people hear about the most often. So that's your Astroglide and your KY. These are the most widely available and they're the cheapest in the pharmacies. They are safe to use with latex items and latex condoms and sex toys and things like that. Um, the thing with the water-based lubricants is that they do tend to dry up very quickly. So people will often say, I feel like I have to reapply it over and over and over again during sex. There's two ways to get around that. One, don't use the water-based, use a different kind. The second is keep a spray bottle of water next to the bed. And I know this sounds ridiculous. Just keep spraying the genitals, both yours and your partner's, during, during sexual uh, activity and will reactivate the lubricant. It, does, it doesn't stain. Um, it rarely causes irritation unless it has glycerin. Glycerin-based lubricants tend to cause more vaginal inflammation and vaginal itching and yeast infections. So you can get it in glycerin-free options. That's um, very common to find. So for example, you can find, I think, Astroglide comes in a glycerin-free option. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is the silicone-based lubricants. The silicone-based lubricants do last longer than the water-based. They can be used in water. They're very moisturizing. This is probably my favorite one for women who are menopausal, postmenopausal. Safe to use with latex condoms, but not good to use with silicone-based toys. So if you have a sex toy, just make sure it's not silicone-based plastic before you use the silicone-based lubricant because it can break it down. It's also available in glycerin-free options. It can be used as massage oil. It's a little bit more expensive and it is a little bit harder to wash off sheets. Oil-based lubricants, a lot of people like to use these because they feel like they're more natural and that's fine as long as you're not using uh, condoms or latex condoms. It may promote vaginal inflammation and irritation. So these are like the petroleum-based um, lubricants. 
The ones that I think are better are the natural oil lubricants that I have on the right. So avocado, corn, olive, it's, this is, I swear, every time I give a talk, people will ask me extra virgin or virgin, whatever. <laughs> and the answer is it really doesn't matter. And I, I promise you I've been asked that. Um, it's very, these, the natural oils are much more, um, they're less irritating than the petroleum based um, and should also not be used with latex items. <clears throat> This is the name of an organic lubricant, so people like the idea of organic. It's called Good Clean Love Almost Naked Personal Lubricant. I think you can buy it online. It's, not, it's actually 95% organic and then 5% natural. Not quite sure what that means. But no glycerin, parabens, or petrochemicals, safe for use with latex condoms, and it is edible. So there you go. You've got it all in this package. It's probably not as lubricating as the silicone-based lubricants. So what about low libido? So I get asked what we do about low libido. Well, for people who, it's not a contraindication for them to be on testosterone and they are post-menopausal, premenopausal women cannot be on testosterone because if they get pregnant and it's a female infant, that can cause what's called a virilization or um, male features to the female infant. Um, testosterone is good for, in general, desire, genital arousal, increases mood, increases bone mass and muscle mass. There was a study that was done looking at testosterone patch versus placebo in women who were not taking estrogen. It was a 52-week study. And essentially what they found is that there was an increase in sexually satisfying episodes within a four-week period. And also there was increase in frequency of these sexually satisfying episodes. Um, we do know that there's a three to 8% incidence of increased hair growth on face and body as well as acne with people who use testosterone, although I will tell you I have plenty of women on testosterone therapy and I think I've had one or two in the past who have had some acne as a result. In this study, four people developed breast cancer in the testosterone group and none in the placebo group. We've kind of seen this across the board where it's, it's not, the jury is still out on whether or not testosterone promotes breast cancer. The answer is we don't know and therefore we don't prescribe testosterone for people who've had a history of breast cancer. Testosterone in general, it does, it's not going to make anybody feel like they're 20 years old again. However, in general, people will say, I think about it more, I dream about it more, and maybe I have one extra sexual episode a month. But having said that, that's good for them. Hey, I went from zero episodes to one, or I went from one to two, and this is making you know, a significant impact on me and my relationship. Um, we talked about the side effects. Acne and hair growth are the two most common. The ones that we worry about when levels of testosterone get too high in women are when they start to look like bodybuilders. So they end up getting the hoarsening of the vo voice. They get the male pattern hair loss, which is temporal hair loss, and they get growth of the clitoris. Those things do not go away. So we tend to want to watch our patients very closely on testosterone. I watch my patients every three months with blood tests, make sure their levels are staying in a postmenopausal range, a, a healthy postmenopausal range. Um, other things we can try is Welbutrin. Has anyone heard of Welbutrin? That's an antidepressant. Wellbutrin is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And basically, norepinephrine and dopamine are the two neurotransmitters associated with uh, arousal in women. So this is the one antidepressant that won't cause sexual dysfunction. Things like Paxil, Prozac, the SSRIs, they do. They cause decreased libido and difficulty achieving orgasm. We oftentimes will use Wellbutrin as an antidote to the SSRI-induced sexual problems. So if someone is on, for example, Prozac and has the low libido or has difficulty with orgasm, we will also put them on Wellbutrin, not as a secondary <clears throat> antidepressant, but to treat those symptoms. We also use it on women who don't have depression, uh, who have those uh, symptoms as well. So we use them very successfully, I find, in premenopausal women. I feel like they don't work as well in postmenopausal women. The dose is about 300 milligrams twice, uh, once a day. So you can do 150 milligrams twice a day or 300 once a day. Argin Max, this is an example of a nutraceutical. So this is something that's bought over the counter. It's not regulated by the FDA. It's a blend of L-arginine, which is an amino acid, Damiana, ginseng, ginkgo biloba, and it's got multivitamin in it. You have to take, it's actually three tablets twice a day the effect is typically seen after four weeks, and usually that effect is 
So increased sexual desire in postmenopausal women. I feel, and this is what's in that last box, I feel like that is probably the only beneficial uh, impact people have from this medication. It's supposed to increase desire, satisfaction, intercourse frequency, all these things. I don't see that in my patients. I see it slightly increased desire, and for some reason it works really well in breast cancer survivors. So I've had a lot of luck with this medication for women who cannot be on any kind of hormonal medication. It has no estrogenic activity in it. It's bought over the counter. Like I said, I think you can get it at GNC stores or at drugstore.com. Drugstore.com, by the way, is a great website for men and women. It's your everyday drugstore items, but it also has, they, they figured out that women and men want to go somewhere where they can buy their sexual health aids, for lack of a better word. And like, you can get vibrators, lubricants, movies, all sorts of things. And it comes in just your regular drugstore.com box. And it's, you know, buy your toothpaste, buy your vibrator. You can get it all in one place. So orgasmic dysfunction, <clears throat> so antidepressants can cause difficulty achieving orgasm. Viagra can actually help premenopausal women who have healthy testosterone levels uh, with orgasmic dysfunction if it's a result of their antidepressant. I also, I also use it in women who are not on antidepressants who have difficulty achieving orgasm. They use it the same way as men, so start with you can start with 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams going up to 100 milligrams one hour before sexual activity, nothing to eat or drink in between, not okay for people who are on nitrate medication um, or have significant heart disease. But the important part is you have to have a premenopausal testosterone level. So this doesn't work on postmenopausal women not using testosterone. Most common side effects are headache and flushing. Zestra is another nutraceutical. It's a topical feminine arousal oil. Um, this also has been shown in two studies actually to be effective at increasing desire, genital arousal, orgasm, and sexual satisfaction. The first one was in a pilot study, I think of about 20 people. The second one was a multi-center trial having, I think, about 300 people. So what you do is you take this oil and you rub it on the genitals, on the clitoris, for about five minutes, and what you feel is sort of like a tingling, warm sensation. But it's not just like the KY warming. It actually has been shown to increase orgasmic intensity and decrease time to orgasm. The only thing I will say is that if you're postmenopausal and using it, it's, you might just feel a little bit more burning. The most common side effect, about 14% of people have it, is mild to moderate burning at the application site. Can't do oral sex if somebody is wearing Zestra because you don't want to get it in the throat. Um, but I have had good success with my patients who have used it. So in the last five minutes, because I know we want to get to questions before we get out of here, is just some clinical pearls. If there is, at the time of diagnosis, if there is relationship dysfunction or sexual dysfunction, that needs to be addressed early. It, you know, I know the last thing on most people's minds after they've been diagnosed with cancer is having sex, but relationships will suffer, sexuality will suffer if there's a problem at the beginning. So getting counseling for that is very important. Body image counseling after treatment, if that's an issue. And early treatment of vaginal dryness in both younger and older women and pre-treatment for fertility discussions. So before chemotherapy or surgery happens, talking about potentially freezing eggs um, before that, if it's possible. Sex after diagnosis and treatment, I always tell women, become comfortable with those body changes. If you've had a mastectomy or if you've had lumpectomy, you know, if a woman doesn't want to do counseling with a therapist, oftentimes I'll have her just do standing in front, in front of a mirror once a day, becoming familiar, comfortable with her new body. That can actually be very effective. It takes a while for women to come to terms, especially younger women, it's been shown um, following mastectomy. Um, use of lingerie, so there is lingerie that's made for people who have colostomies, people who have had a mastectomy, so there's many websites that um, offer those. Self-exploration kind of goes along with standing in front of the mirror and feeling your, your new body, getting comfortable with it. And then pain medications, liberal use of pain medications. So if you're having pain, use those pain medications, just not to the point that you're so exhausted that you're gonna fall asleep during, which can happen. Mm -hmm. um, to diminish fear and anxiety about having sex again, choose a time when symptoms are well controlled. Again, liberal use of vaginal lubricants and moisturizers. And I always say, get back into sexual activity in a stepwise basis. Don't just jump back into having sex again. Start with hugging, kissing, touching, intimacy. This can happen over a week. This can happen over several weeks to months. So there's something, the goal is intimacy, by the way. The goal isn't just sex. It's becoming close to your partner again. 
Sometimes patients need a little bit more than just what we can offer them from a medical perspective. They need psychological counseling and sometimes sex therapy can be extremely effective. What does a sex therapist do? People kind of get scared when they hear sex therapy. They are not sex surrogates. They literally are counselors who deal with a specific problem. So what they do is they construct a problem list, they formulate goals and interventions. They, the focus is usually on the sexuality issue. If there's a relationship issue, depression, um, those have to be addressed first. Oftentimes, uh, sex therapists will do what's called sensate focus. So they'll have, this is what I talked about. So this is stepwise, sort of getting back into sexuality with your partner in a stepwise fashion. So we'll say, cre you know, for the first week, you're gonna create a really romantic environment with your partner. And this just doesn't go for people who have had cancer. This is for anybody who's had some kind of relationship or mar marital problem where intimacy has suffered. So you want to create a relaxing environment, you know, music, candles, get the kids out of the house, whatever it is. Um, you know, the first week we say, you know, with your clothes on, you can start just with touching. It could be touching each other's arms, face, whatever. We want to avoid breasts and genitals as much as possible. So kind of take no stress about sexual um, fondling. Phase two is usually touching of the genitals and breasts, focusing on verbal and non-verbal cues. Uh, Phase three, which can happen several weeks down the line, is mutual touching. We usually avoid intercourse at this point, and stage four is oftentimes intercourse if ready. And again, this can take a week, this can take six months, this could take a year. For people who are getting back into the dating scene, we want to ease back into the dating scene, become comfortable in other social situations first. So after your diagnosis, start going to the gym, take new classes. Um, practice telling your friends. So if you want to get ready to tell a potential new partner, Practice on your friends first. Um, decide when the right time to disclose your diagnosis to a date. So again, practicing on friends, be honest about upcoming treatments and surgeries. So what I have seen, which can be unfair to the prospective partner, is when someone chooses not to tell them, I've had cancer and I have all these treatments and surgeries that are upcoming, and then they sort of spring, spring it on them at the last minute. And then the partner, and, and they expect, well, you know, we've been together, you know, we really take, like each other, you should understand and be there for me. It's not fair to that person. Not everybody can handle it. So I always say, <clears throat> tell them before the treatment. Don't tell them the day before that you're going in for your breast reconstruction surgery. The other thing is, don't wait until after the relationship has become sexually intimate. That's another that kind of goes along with the first thing I said. Um, that's also sort of tricking somebody in a sense. You want to be upfront and honest. The best, you know, most important part of a relationship is honesty. So you want to tell them before the relationship has become sexually intimate, mostly because once it has, there's a certain level of emotional intimacy with that person. It can be very heartbreaking to that person who has gone through cancer, gone through the treatment, to then have a partner leave them after they become sexual because they didn't know the partner can't handle it. So it's better for everyone, but most importantly, the cancer survivor to be upfront and honest at the beginning. Um, this is the last slide. This is just, I think, for overall general health, but there was a study that showed that women who had female sexual dysfunction, who also happened to have something called metabolic syndrome, um, who were put on the Mediterranean diet, which is fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grain, olive oil, thing like that, um, compared to other women who just stayed on their everyday diet. The women who are on the Mediterranean diet did have improvements on something called the Female Sexual Function Index, um, and that is basically looking at all sort of areas of sexual functioning. So diet, maybe because you're feeling healthier, you're losing weight for whatever reason, feeling better about your body um, can improve sexual function overall. And I think that's all I have for you. Oh, exercise improves energy overall well-being enhances mood. So that can also be very good for sexual function. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for questions, yeah? 15 minutes, maybe? Yeah? Okay. So I have a question for uh, Eisenberg. So do you ever put, um, well, you mentioned putting men back on testosterone. Do you do it for prostate cancer patients? And do you measure the levels much like putting, you know, Vagifem and yeah, that's a great question. So um, the old way of thinking used to be that, you know, adding, putting a man on testosterone with a history of prostate cancer was sort of like adding fuel to a fire, pouring gasoline on a fire. But I think thinking is actually coming around and evolving now. So I think it can be done safely. So if a man has very, very low testosterone levels, you know, 
what would be normal for a woman, for example, then it's probably not a good idea to put them on testosterone. But if a man has sort of a low, low normal level for himself, then it's probably safe to do it. And I definitely follow testosterone levels, I follow PSA levels. And I'd say, you know, at this point, the risk is unknown, but it's been done safely. So if you look at any testosterone product, it'll say, don't use it if you have a history of prostate cancer. But we have lots of experience, and lots of follow-up, and, and it can be done safely. But I think men should just understand the risk right now is unknown. But, you know, a good example that I always give men is, you know, every man that has a history of prostate cancer, we don't get their testosterone down to zero. We don't cut off their testicles, for example. So why should it be if they're a little bit low to start that we don't get them to a normal level? And if they're on androgen therapy? At the time of diagnosis? Or after, then you wouldn't get them testosterone. Oh, if they're on, oh, androgen ablation therapy? Yeah. Uh, you know, it depends. Sometimes uh, men get it in sort of an adjuvant setting along with radiation. I think <clears throat> if they're far enough out, you know, I have a discussion, uh, just like Dr. Milheiser with the oncologist, and see if it's safe. I think that typically it won't burn any bridges. If we put it on it and there is a relapse, we can always stop it at that point. But I think, again, it's, <clears throat> it's unusual because I think actually thinking is evolving a little bit, and it's thought actually that men with lower testosterone have higher risk of prostate cancer. So, so guys. Mm -hmm. So when do they, when would, when would you measure my testosterone level, and how would I know if you've done that? Uh, so um, whenever I see a man with sexual dysfunction of any kind, I always measure their testosterone level. After prostate cancer treatment, I think once, if the PSA level is undetectable, for you know, after three months after surgery, primary treatment, or six months, somewhere in that window, um, and the testosterone level is low, I'd, I'd restart. I'd start testosterone at that point. In your experience uh, between the different, uh, like Viagra, Cialis, the, those different ones in the vitro, I had heard that there was um, different levels of side effects associated with them and less nausea with the vitro and some of that stuff. What's your experience being with those? Yeah, so the main side effects that men complain about Headache, facial flushing, backache, leg cramps, indigestion, nasal congestion. Um, Viagra can give you a, a blue hue as well, rarely. I think men can get all those with all of them. But sometimes, um, for reasons that are not understood, some men have more side effects with one than the other. Similarly, you know, men that don't respond to one, you know, about 30 or 40 percent will respond to another one. You know, again, for unclear reasons, even though the mechanisms are similar. So I'd say if men does, don't tolerate one, I usually try another one and see how they do. Um, in terms of preparing men for surgery, I mean, how much is the preparation, like uh, you were saying for women, that they're not really warned well about what the side effects can be? I think the same probably applies to men yeah. being warned about what the potential fallout can be and the impact to their sexuality and their performance, uh, all of it, you know. And I don't know, is there uh, like, um, kind of a real policy around how that's handled, or is it just individual doctors? Or? I think a lot of it is individual doctors, but I think, you know, universally, as Dr. Milheiser said, I think being upfront with patients and setting expectations is probably the most important. So men should know that, um, you know, after, for example, prostate cancer surgery, there are definitely going to be impacts on, you know, erectile function, orgasm can change, all those sorts of things around that. In addition to continence, you know, and, and cancer outcomes, I think, I think you know, here, you know, my partners, I think, do a good job, but I think, you know, in the community, I think most people know about it, but, you know, obviously it can be a little bit variable. Mm -hmm. um, just the psychological effect, though, overall, of an impact of a cancer diagnosis, uh, just that impacting your, your self, your sense of yourself as a sexual person, isn't that a factor that's hard to measure and quantify of how that actually shows up, you know, in, in, um, in a patient, like how much of it is the fact that they've had surgery, how much of it is the fact that, you know, there is physical fallout, and how much of it is just that all of these changes are impacting the life dramatically. That yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And I think that, you know, once I think you sit down and talk to a man, and oftentimes, you know, I always, hopefully the partner comes in too, because it is a team sport, 
I think you can kind of get a sense of, um, you know, the different factors at play. And I think, you know, certainly organic, there is going to be a big organic component after, you know, major pelvic surgery, for example. But there is a psychological component as well. And so I do, you know, similar to Dr. Milheiser, do kind of advocate sort of a, a stepwise approach as well, you know. And when we talk about this rehabilitation program, when I was saying, you know, we want to restore erections and do it on a regular basis, you know, I don't want people to tell them not to have sex more often than they used to necessarily, but, you know, just to get erections, you just do it in the bathroom, do it when you're alone, but, you know, the goal is just to restore blood flow, not necessarily to become hypersexual during this, this post-operative period. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so if, in the um, so if Cialis mm -hmm. and uh, Viagra and I'm also trying mm -hmm. to be, yeah, that, mm -hmm. if, if it's like it varies and sometimes doesn't work at all mm -hmm. and have used other, um, have used the injections, mm -hmm. which is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of, what do you do? What, I mean, you know, what are, are there <coughs> other options? You know, what are the other options? And, uh, yeah, so there, there's, I mean, those are kind of, those are two of the options. You know, we, we talked about, so there's oral pills, you know, the Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, always check testosterone, because if it's low, we can make you more responsive. We also go over proper dosing as well. With uh, you know Levitra Viagra, it's very important you take it on an empty stomach, so that could potentially be a reason for um, you know sometimes not working. I also you know again FDA approvals up to 100 milligrams. Dr. Milheiser said for Viagra, for example, sometimes I'll go up to 200 milligrams as long as men are tolerating it. So you can go up a little bit higher on some of the medications. In addition to injections, there's also a medicine you can put in the tip of the penis. It's absorbed by the penis. There's a vacuum erection device which can also work, and there's surgery. So. I think there's a lot we can do. It just depends basically how aggressive a man wants to be. Um, but there's, yeah, there's always things that we can do. Did you have a question? Um, I was just wondering if you could say anything about uh, what the FDA gave as the reason why they did not approve the testosterone. Yes. So the testosterone was that they felt there wasn't enough safety data. They wanted more safety, they wanted five year safety data. So they actually did approve it in Europe. The same time it was rejected here, it was approved in Europe. So they have that data. We actually have information um, showing that testosterone does not cause heart disease. Actually, it's probably protective against heart disease. It doesn't cause abnormal lipid um, metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. Um, the only area where it's still up for debate is breast cancer. However, the newer data is showing that it probably does not. It may even be protective, but we don't know for sure yet. So we just, you know, we have to counsel, counsel patients that we don't know absolutely whether or not it could potentially promote breast cancer and it won't, wouldn't be recommended for, it would be like hormone replacement therapy, right? We, you know, the jury's still out on whether estrogen alone or estrogen progesterone causes it. We know there's a link, so therefore if you're at high risk, you know, you're not supposed to be on it. You're only supposed to be on it for a short amount of, of time. <coughs> it's the same thing with testosterone. Yeah, there was yeah there was one called flibanserin, and that one was also initially um, being investigated as, as an antidepressant, but actually was shown to increase uh, libido. <coughs> um, so it was for women who I think they put premenopausal women on it, um, but it was sort of this it was sort of another safety um, issue again that sort of blocked it. But the data was there that it was safe and effective, and you know. Listen, we, it, who knows? We still live in, in a sense, a very puritanical country. Who knows? There's certainly a lot of medications that are available for men that have significant side effects. So why would it be that they keep blocking ones for women? So, you know, people have their arguments as to what it is, but they, you know, they said, listen, for both of these, we just need more safety information. So with the testosterone <coughs> patch, there was, unfortunately, it's kind of sad, there was a medication called Libigel, which is a testosterone gel, which was um, going to be going up. That was the next one on the pipeline to go up for approval. But actually, <coughs> they didn't meet some of their endpoints in, this, in the data that they were looking at. 
So I think they've sort of had to go back and sort of revamp things a little bit, meaning it wasn't as effective as they thought it was going to be. <coughs> but we know that with testosterone. <laughs> it's not, you know, listen, it's not going to make you want to have sex all the time like you're 20 years old again. But hey, one extra episode per month can be very important, like I said. So, you know, there are some medications that are certainly being looked into right now and being developed, and hopefully over the years we will have something. But we do have medications, like I said, that are off-label that we can use very effectively in both pre- and post-menopausal women who have had cancer. I might have one question about the pumps and the injection. Um, you had said, I was, uh, it was a question that I had thought about before, and you had kind of said that it doesn't interfere with the natural, like having a natural erection later, because mm -hmm. I thought some of that might artificially make it happen, and then maybe that makes something weaker that it wouldn't automatically happen. So you're saying it's actually a, it's a good rehabilitation tool to yep. be more effective later, so it's not going to damage any innate erections from happening. Yeah, so the injection therapy, is that's been shown to be beneficial because it brings oxygenated blood into the penis, which is, we know is useful. Um, the vacuum erection device can help length maintenance, not necessarily restoration of normal spontaneous erections, but just maintenance of length after, okay. after uh, cancer treatment. Uh, the medication, the Agra, et cetera, that also brings oxygenated. Yes, so. but that has to be done on a, a very regular basis. Hey, just a question, I, I, what's the soonest that you, uh, after surgery, prostate, surgery that you start people on the medication, Viagra, or whatever? Um, you know, it depends how aggressive a man wants to be. Sometimes in the hospital, mm -hmm. sometimes a catheter removal, um, you know, at 10 to 14 days. Okay. So I had a, a question about vagicum. <coughs> so have you, you said you measure the estradiol levels mm -hmm. and then you do it again at three months. Mm -hmm. And then when do you do it again? I do it at three months, six months, and then usually at six months, if they're stable, I might wait till a year. Mm -hmm. But if I see that they might be creeping up from three months to six months, just slightly, I'll check them again at nine months. If I see that it's made a big jump, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll drop them down to once a week instead of twice a week. Mm -hmm. um, usually that doesn't happen. Yeah. So it's so minimally absorbed that you really don't see much of a noticeable change at all. And you must have quite a few patients that are been on years now, mm -hmm. doing well. Very. Mm -hmm. It, you know, at the end of the day, it's a quality of life issue. So, you know, great, I've, I've survived my breast cancer. I'm going to live a healthy, long life, but I can't have sex. And for a lot of women, that's, you know, they can't handle that. That's not acceptable. So they will take that minute risk of, hey, you're going to have a small bump in your estrogen levels because they want that quality of life back. They want to be intimate with their partner. So. Thank you very much. You guys have been a great crowd. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming.